Good evening and welcome to the first part of our program. Today we have exclusive interview with a very important personality, global personality, the first part of the program. In the second part we'll have a certain minister of the United Kingdom. Both of them uh, have worked for the United Kingdom, but my first guest is intrinsically Ghanaian, but the Right Honorable Paul Boatin has graciously joined us um, away from his very busy schedule at Afghan Investment Forum. Right Honorable, thank you very much for coming. Good to be with you, Paul. It's a pleasure. This is the first time you're coming on the program. Last year we tried to get you uh, in the heat of the election, but you came and you were whisked away, I believe, by your responsibilities. Ah. But I'm here now and I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, one thing he likes me to uh, remind all of you is that he's very proud of his Accra Academy heritage. And would you like to say something about Accra Academy? Accra Academy. <laughs> <laughs> but Accra Academy was, for me, a formative experience mm -hmm. because we had some of the best uh, teachers of our generation. Mm -hmm. um, Harm, Ado, mm -hmm. uh, Kunwa. Uh, yeah. These were great uh, educationalists. And they gave me a grounding an academic grounding which stood me in good stead as I made my uh, way uh, in life in the United Kingdom. So I'm very grateful to Accra Akar and we have a very strong old boys uh, association which I'm glad to support and be a member of uh, in London. When I was an MP we used to meet uh, in, the House of, uh, in the House of Commons. So a big thank you to Sam Sachs and others, the other old boys uh, who make uh, all of that possible because a school is nothing without its alumni. I think mm. one of the things we have to understand in the 21st century that if we're to maintain the quality of education then we have to keep on giving to our old schools mm. so subsequent generations uh, can, can mm. benefit. Mm. But you are also a very important minister in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, at the Treasury. Uh, apart from your formative years and growing up in England, you became a member of Parliament in, in, in the British Parliament and a key member of uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair's administration. Uh, can you tell us what your responsibility was in, in that government? In the well, I held a number of portfolios during my eight years as a minister. I began as a, a very junior health minister, the responsibility for social services and mental health. I then went on from that to become police minister. Uh, and, and then uh, Deputy Home Secretary and Police and Corrections Minister before going into the Treasury, first of all as Financial Secretary and then as Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And the role of Chief Secretary in the United Kingdom is to be one of two Cabinet Ministers in the Treasury with the responsibility for public spending and the control of public spending and our productivity and reform agenda. So it's an important ministry in terms of the control uh, of, of, of spending, but it's also very much a, a ministry devoted to delivery because the modern treasury, whether in the United Kingdom or, or uh, as a ministry of finance in, in Ghana or in any country, has to be concerned not just with the control of spending, yeah, important though that is, particularly in these times, it also has to be concerned with how you maximize um, the uh, efficiency of spending. How you, uh, the Chancellor in our system has overall responsibility for the economy uh, and for the raising of revenue. Uh, but it's important to have a, a part of the ministry devoted to the control of spending and its more effective use. So it becomes outcome orientated. All too often in government, uh, we are concerned with uh, inputs. Uh, we forget the importance of outcomes. What difference does uh, a CD spent, a pound spent, uh, make to the life of the ordinary citizen when you're looking at education, at health, at transportation, uh, or any of these important areas of government? It's an important opportunity for me because I'll be asking you a few questions about the ongoing discourse about African development, uh, some of the very naughty points. Uh, I'll be bringing it up. But I'd like us to uh, spend a bit of time talking about the African Investment Forum because that's what brought you here. The critics of events like that, uh, the Right Honorable Paul Boatin, say that these things become talk shop, nothing really happens, and the Africans go back home, you know, with really nothing. It Those critics really ought to spend some time at this conference, not just in the plenary sessions, where we were dealing with practical issues uh, about how you ensure that you have effective public-private partnerships, how you go about raising money uh, on the international uh, capital markets, uh, how you ensure uh, that you create uh, trade facilitation uh, policies uh, that promote trade between African countries as well as are always looking outwards, uh, east uh, or, or west. Uh, how also and importantly uh, you build relationships uh, between government, uh, the private sector, uh, uh, the public sector, civil society that deliver 
positive practical results. But have we not discussed these before? Well, the important thing is that this is an opportunity. Let me, give you, let me just give you an example. Uh, for people who are considering making an investment in Ghana, in Togo, in Namibia, the heads of state of all those three countries uh, were present to actually meet the ministers, meet the public officials, meet other businessmen who are making similar in investments in order that we can make those investments go from planning stage to uh, delivery stage. That requires... So the, the availability of the number one person... Will it's, it's, all, it's always important, but also the availability of key decision makers within the ministry. That's important. That's why if you look at the uh, Africa Investment uh, Forum literature, you'll see that it is supported by a number of key companies who are or who wish to do uh, business uh, in, in Africa. And I think they should be congratulated uh, on their foresight. So it's not about another talking shop. This is a place where people do business. And the good news is that as a result of the uh, foresight uh, of the Ghanaian government, of the Ghana Investment Promotion uh, Center, this uh, was held for the first time outside South Africa. It was held in Ghana. Mm. In the past, the Commonwealth Business Council has met for this Africa Investment Forum in South Africa. This time, they chose Ghana. I'll be uh, talking to you about South Africa and also. And that's good yeah. news. Because so I think the knockers should be a, a bit more positive. Sometimes we have too much knocking, uh, too much criticism, not enough constructive participation and action. But will it not be justified the criticism when after 53 years of independence, with all the wealth that Africa seems to possess, and you've been High Commissioner in South Africa, so you're well versed in, in all of these matters. After 53 years of independence for most African countries, Nigeria is going to celebrate its uh, Golden Jubilee of Independence this year. Africa is still poor, very, very poor. It means something has gone wrong. But the, the discussion about Africa has been going on ever since the Britain Woods institutions were set up after the Second World War. It's been going on in the 70s and 80s. It's been, it's been going on forever. I think we've got, Paul, some very hard questions to ask ourselves. I mean, I, for instance, uh, am horrified uh, that we, in a situation in, Ga in Ghana and in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana is no exception. Ghana has made huge progress in some areas. But in other areas, you know, we've actually gone back. Uh, if you look uh, at uh, the state of the infrastructure in Ghana, I am the proud son uh, and grandson of a cocoa farmer. Uh, I'm Koko Bwateng's son, but I'm Pa Champong's grandson. He was a cocoa farmer in Tafo, at Chimtafo. When he was a cocoa farmer, earning enough money to educate my father and his uh, siblings from the proceeds of cocoa alone, there was a train line between Achimtafo uh, and Takaradi. So mm -hmm. he could harvest his crop and know that it would get to the port. Those train lines no longer exist. If you take sub-Saharan Africa as a, as a whole, there, there are fewer uh, roads by miles available now than there were 30 years ago. Now that's an indictment. It's an indictment not just, I fear, of failures in African leadership, but it's also an indictment of the World Bank the Bretton Wood institutions, as you described them, the International Monetary Fund, whose policies over the years, up until uh, recently, have actually been opposed to infrastructure investment. There was a time when it wasn't fashionable uh, for the World Bank and other international financial institutions to support investment in infrastructure. That, I'm happy to say, has now changed. Changed partly as a result of the Africa Commission and the important work mm. instituted by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. So, yes, there have been policy failures in the past. There have been failures of government, governance in the past. But the important thing, Paul, is to learn from these. Not to go on harping on and on about them, but to learn yes, from will, them and then will, to we move will, forward. We will learn from that.